Canadian content rules were just coming into play in 67. And uh, so um, I thought, well, we'll have a band with all brass and rhythm section like a kind of, not really a jazz band, uh, just a, a contemporary, but a big band that I could write for. We'll call it the Boss Brass. We'll do uh, covers of hip parade material and uh, blah, blah. So here's a good project for me. We'll do an album or something. So I, uh, funny enough, I went to the CBC and uh, wasn't any, uh, there was some interest, but the, the timing wasn't right. And the same day, it was Dave Bird was the producer in radio at that time. So I just phoned somebody else and uh, uh, it was Lyman Potts at the Canadian Talent Library. I phoned him like from the refusal and at the CBC and I said, Lyman, I'll, I'll take you to France for lunch. So I asked him and uh, he said, he said, okay, and that, that was the start of it. So it was a, com a completely commercial enterprise. Uh, all right, it'll be the boss brass. Now you give me 25 tunes that you'd like done. We recorded uh, Little Green Apples and Delilah. And hardly, well, hardly, uh, no jazz solos. <laughs> Another, we got a lot of airplay on the Canadian Talent Library stations, particularly, and then we we eventually did some recording for the CBC. And, but then I found the the end of it was very. I mean, our tunes were three, four minutes long. It was becoming very boring almost immediately to play some of this material again. So we were playing in a club, the Savern, then, and, and uh, about one week in the Savern, and we were just music was all everybody was completely teed off so so it meant well rob has to now start writing music that will not tee the band off which became jazzier and jazzier and in 71 we added the saxophones because that was a, the commercial idea was one thing but the musical idea was was another one
the first time that happened, it was gratifying, especially being a Canadian, because you know, there's lots of bands in Canada and uh, no other band that I know of have, have been nominated for a Grammy, uh, certainly at that time and even at this time. The business is so small in terms of, well, first of all, you have the music business and then you have Mikey making 120 million or something. I mean, Mikey makes more in one night than the Boss Brass will make in the whole history of the band. So it's, it's a little discouraging that way. Now, what does a Grammy Award or award of some kind mean? Well, it, it's going to make such a little difference that it's, uh, it's negligible, I, I think. But then the people that put up the money, we currently record for Concord Records of Concord, California. They seem pleased about it, you know. They, 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 and then they might, it might lean their decision, uh, like in 93, winning a Grammy, might mean that they record us in 94. Now, it turns out that we're going to record in 94, but uh, did that have something to do with it? I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that they're not making a whole bunch more money or, oh, we're making a lot of money with the Boss Brass now, let's record them again. It's a, they make enough to, to just finance another album, which may be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. We feel very pleased that they would do so. Uh, I mean, it's recording, it keeps us, keeps me going, you know, so if you don't have a record, I don't know well, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. I think I'll just lie down. <laughs> really hard uh, and I'm not complimenting myself on how tricky I am it's just I've had all these great musicians playing with me for so long that I just keep on writing harder and harder I don't even consider there uh, that this is going to be hard I mean if you have a trumpet player that and you write a high F for him and then he takes it up another third well then the next time you write write it up a third you know or or uh, saxophone solis like uh, we play, uh, or uh, particularly hard ballads with, with woodwinds and, you know, all these things. Well, there's not many bands that have that, uh, that expertise, you know, to work with. They say, well, gee, we can't, I can't write this because I don't have guys that play clarinet and flute and saxophone and play in tune and, and can play a tempo that's, you know, I do. Uh, I mean, these are really among the best musicians uh, in the world and and in the boss brass 
they're certainly be really hard pressed to come up with uh, 20 guys of that caliber in any other band that I know of. There are some, and uh, but is there another band with Ed Bickert, uh, Guido Basso, Mo Kaufman, John Johnson, Rick Wilkins, Eugene Amaro, Al Kay, you know, on and on, Arnie Chikoski? No. <laughs>
cliffs was a thing, you know, like a really solid, really bash in your face flag waver, you know, something that's like, you know, that really will get this, you know, after a ballad and a medium bounce and a this and everybody's going, you know, and it, you know, so that was the reason for that. And uh, actually, I stole most of the idea from Bob Florence, as it says on the album, because he had a piece like that. And I thought, that's what we need. We need something really, like, buzzing, like, immediately buzzing. Uh, what did I put on the parts? Immediately throbbing. <laughs> well, I don't do daily things in the music business that take me to Toronto. If I do get called for one, I'd go and do it. I was a man of two homes at one time and one had to go and, and we decided that it was the city one. Well, more or less, the way my career is now, this kind of suits me. I do a fair amount of traveling in my, you know, college uh, teaching clinic work, uh, so. Uh, and this last year, I was on the road for a month with Mulligan and and in, uh, went on the road for a month in England with a Danish radio band. So I, I get things like that to uh, break up the schedule. Actually, it's harder on my wife. She doesn't, she doesn't get things, but then she can go into Toronto and visit our children. And... spot it is good and I don't it wouldn't it wouldn't be the boss brass or it wouldn't be me if I was writing so this new thought-provoking uh, John Didge uh, I mean there's other people that do that and fine, just let me do what I, I do I mean it's not harmful to your body or anything I mean it's not you know it's just uh, is it not all right just to to be one of the best in the world that's what you do uh, I, I think it's delightful. I mean, uh, I never, I never knew that I would have that distinction.
seeing the the young guys uh, come up on a on a bus trip or something somewhere and hearing the new generation of guys being as outrageous or more so than you know like carrying the the personal and outrageous torch and humor and everything ahead is one of the biggest pleasures uh, because there's no uh, uh, there's no moss growing on uh, Steve McDade or John McLeod or John Johnson. The younger guys in the band are uh, as nuts as Guido and myself and Ian and, you know, and uh, to see them in action is really uh, fun. And uh, all our bus trips have been fun. I mean, I guess, I guess one of the, the favorite, the band chorus, you see, Guido gets busy on the band vocal group on bus trips so we can sing Mr. Sandman with everybody on one note. So you need, I think, da 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 You need 13 people, you see, with no repeated notes. <laughs> well, I think Guido's been trying to do this for, well, 20 years at least. And uh, it needs a certain amount of lubrication to uh, get going, usually. And... Uh, and it's usually absolutely horrible. And to the point now that there's several guys that won't take the bus. <laughs> so certainly the Mr. Sandman vocal group uh, has been fun for a long time. And uh, new guys that come in the band that have never heard of Mr. Sandman. Now Guido says, OK, now here's your note. Da, 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 da. That's your note, OK. And some, you know, new guy in the band says, what the hell is this? I mean, what is this singing Mr. Sandman? That wasn't in the job description. <laughs> I don't know how, and certainly I liked them the way they were before, uh, for many reasons. I miss all the hanging out, for one thing. I miss the income. Uh, we had a hell of a good time for many years there, and I was very fortunate to be part of it. Um, to the point now that there isn't one band on television of the kind of bands that I played with for 25, 30 years. Um, so the last one was The Tonight Show a steady gig with a 18-piece band. There's no more of it. There's no variety shows. There's... So the... You know, uh, so it's changed. Well, uh, has it changed for the better? Uh, no. As far as I'm concerned, it's been a drag. And uh, do you see a lot of trombone players in studios? No. <laughs> you see a lot of electronic music, and you hear a lot of it on jingles and things. And... Uh, and uh, and that is the situation. But you know, I don't know that I'll live long enough, but it'll probably come back. It'll go and somebody will hear a trombone someday and say, you know, that's the sound I like. It sounds so personal and so good. Now, can you do that on your machine? No. So they can approximate it, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just kind of, uh, and certainly the financial end of it is, and the personal end of it. Would you rather, if you're not interested in musicians or music, and your choice is spending $20,000 on one guy in the studio with a bunch of electronic equipment, or having 16 musicians, uh, <laughs> I know what I'd pick. <laughs> because, you know, you, then you have to deal with personalities and guys being late and guys being grumpy and uh, all this. Uh, this way, you're just dealing with machinery. Plug it in, let's go. You know, no overtime, no nothing. I, I, I can see the appeal. It's just that I don't see any appeal in the music, or I don't like the change that has come. But, you know, I'm an old fart and uh, can't do anything about it anyway, so.
Club dates are really the fun, the most fun. This is, it, it, there's no other reason to do them. You know, they're not all the pressure of the concert. Now, which do you want to do? Play a night at Roy Thompson, uh, a big concert hall, see over 3,000 people. You have to get dressed up. You have to do a sound check. You have to do all this. And all the pressure of delivering and having it full and playing our best and the sound system working. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to do this? Do you want to do six nights in a club? The same money. I'll take six nights in a club. If it, what is the most fun? I don't really see any reason to do big concerts like that. Uh, I mean, so what's the same amount of money as six nights in a club? Well, it's not very much anyway. So uh, why, why not do the fun thing? For my uh, age and experience and my position in the music business, I mean, are there many that can play and write and have a big band, play some other gigs, play with other people? I feel very fortunate. Now this is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that I just go through every day, man, am I fortunate. No, I go through every day saying, damn it, why don't I get, I mean, I'm not easily satisfied, so, but uh, I am fortunate. There's no, hate to be so easy, but. <laughs> I want two, three, four.